Is that okay? Louder? All right, good. Um, okay, thanks very much. Um, thanks for sticking around. I'm also a postdoc at the University of Hull, and I'm also going to be talking about comparative analyses of invasion success in birth rates. Um, but specifically, I'm going to be talking about how human introduction efforts promotes the likelihood that introduced mammal species become widespread invaders, uh, like these common examples shown on the slide, for example. Uh, before I start, I'd like to thank my colleagues Stephen Bella Capoli and Will Allen um, and the Natural Environment Research Council for funding this project. Uh, so a recent review article described invasion biology as the succession of numbers games. And this is because the best predictor of whether an introduced species goes on to become an invader is introduction effort, which refers to the total number of individuals released into novel areas. So in order to establish um, a self-sustaining population um, when introduced outside of its native range, a species has to be introduced in sufficient numbers to overcome the extinction risks associated with small population size. And furthermore, larger introduced populations are more likely to go on to become widespread invaders, like the European rabbit in Australia, for example. Uh, now thinking about introduction efforts at the global scale, um, the total amount of introduction effort worldwide um, can be either concentrated into single or few uh, very large releases of populations, or distributed widely in space and time across numerous releases of smaller populations, and these can be thought of as different uh, release strategies. Um, so all else being equal, we should always expect a larger introduced population to be more likely to uh, succeed in the novel environment than a smaller one, and this could be due simply to the effects of demographic stochasticity, so individual uh, variation in survival and reproduction within the population um, just due to chance alone. So we might expect that concentrating introduction effort into large releases is most likely to promote invasion success. Uh, and this effect can also be reinforced by uh, positive death density dependence or alley effects, um, where the individual fitness is correlated with the population size. And this could be due, for example, to adaptations to sociality or because it's difficult to find mates when populations are small. And genetic effects such as inbreeding depression can also play a role in the failure of small populations to survive. And um, this is exactly what a recent theoretical model predicted um, by Philip Cassie and colleagues, which was designed to emulate the typical conditions of bird introductions. Um, they found that um, concentrating introduction effort into a single release, um, averaged across a range of model conditions, was more likely to lead to establishment success than splitting introduction effort into several releases. But um, on the other hand, distributing introduction effort into multiple releases increases the chance that at least one of those introduced populations around the world is able to uh, survive in the normal environment. And this is because of the effect of um, habitat matching, uh, so the extent to which the features of the local environment match the ecological niche to which the introduced species is adapted, and also in terms of um, temporal uh, environmental variation, like short-term climate fluctuations, for example. And uh, conversely to the Cassie model, um, two other theoretical models, one in 2014 by uh, Richard Duck and colleagues, and one by Grosvenor in 1999, suggested that when environmental variation is high, um, a large introduced population isn't guaranteed to be able to establish. And just to illustrate this with a very simple example, like imagine what would happen if you introduce polar bears to a rainforest. It probably doesn't matter how many you introduce, they're unlikely to be able to survive because of poor habitat matching. Um, so what I wanted to do with this project was to put these different release strategies to the test. Um, using a global data set of related invasions. Um, and this consisted of data on introduction outcomes, the number of unique introduction locations, and the number of introduced individuals, um, which uh, Will Allen and I collected from the most comprehensive secondary sources, like the Global Invasive Species Database, for example, um, which we also updated by going to primary literature to improve the data quality and uh, supplement missing information. Um, resulting in probably the largest and most comprehensive mammalian invasions, uh, like I said, at the global scale to date. So, um, as you can imagine, because these are historical records, uh, we don't have data on the number of released individuals for a lot of introductions, um, especially those, for example, of uh, commensal species, like rats and mice, that tend to be introduced in probably very large but unrecorded numbers. But we did have some data on the number of individuals released for 109 introduced mammal species, and of these, 14 failed to ever establish a self-sustaining population, 95 succeeded in establishing, 
and of those established species, uh, 23 um, only ever established populations that remain fairly localised, and this we consider not to have spread. 34 had an uncertain outcome because of insufficient information. Um, 37 species uh, showed dramatic expansion of range of numbers beyond the introduction of location, um, exhibiting the kind of classic um, hallmarks of invasive species, so expanding quickly to cover really large areas of uh, countries or even continents. Um, and time-wise data, um, I used biologically informed generalised area mixed models um, at the species level, um, fitting private models to predict success at establishment and spread from the number of individuals and the number of locations. And these are always entered in the same model because it was the relative effects of these two predictors that I wanted to look at. Um, and so, if concentration of introduction ethics is most likely to promote invasion success, then the number of individuals introduced should be the best predictor of invasion success. Conversely, if the distribution of introduction effort across time and space is most likely to lead to invasion success, then the number of construction locations should best predict establishment and spread. Um, I used a Bayesian MCMC approach in the R package MCMC GLM. So I'll be reporting um, mean parameter estimates from posterior distributions with 95% critical intervals. And as an estimate of effect size, I'll be reporting average partial effects. And these require a little definition. Um, so what these are is changes in the uh, probability of success or failure in the outcome variables, in this case, uh, establishment or spread, from a unit change in a given independent variable averaged across all values of all of the independent variables in the model. Hopefully that will make a bit more sense to you as well. Okay, so <coughs> before I show you the main results, um, it's quite interesting just to look at the distribution of invasion success across this sample. So this slide shows um, the species that we know have spread in red, and those we know have established that never spread in white, mapped onto the species biology. Um, and you can see that although the distribution of spread doesn't closely follow the biogenetic groupings, I think there is some evidence of biogenetic signal. For example, in uh, the group that contains, this is the broken group that contains beavers, muskrats, and koi boos, and they're all uh, fairly notorious invaders and all closely related. So it just gives you an idea of why it's important to use a biogenetically informed approach for the marginalities of species invasions. Okay, um, so these are the results of the model predicting establishment success from the number of locations and the number of individuals. Um, and the number of individuals is summed across all locations for each species. And um, because of um, patchiness in the data, of course, we can only consider this a minimum estimate. Um, so on the y-axis is the probability of establishment, and on the x-axis here is the number of locations, and here's the number of individuals. These are both on the log scale. So uh, the gray cross is our the raw data, and the filled circles are the values fitted by the model. Um, so first we'll look at the effect of the number of locations on establishment. Um, so the posterior distribution is very significantly shifted away from zero. So there is a strong positive effect of the number of locations on the probability of establishment. Um, and it's an asymptotic relationship that increases quite rapidly from one through to maybe uh, five or six introduction locations to the point that when you reach 10 introduction locations, the probability of establishment is practically 100%. And um, average across all values of the independent variables in the model, um, increasing by one introduction location increases the probability of establishment by about 5%. So that gives you an idea of the size of the effect. Uh, contrastingly, um, there's only very weak evidence for any effect of the number of introduced individuals on establishment when we control the number of locations. Um, because the posterior distribution is essentially zero, and you can see in the fixed values um, that although the property of establishment is increasing in discrete steps when it increases the number of locations indicated by the different colours, that's this striping pattern that's evident here, and going from one to two to three or more locations is increasing the likelihood of establishment. But within these categories, uh, the property of establishment stays pretty constant even over quite a wide range of the number of introduced individuals, so say from 10 to 100 or even 1,000. Um, and in models like this, when we're trying to estimate uh, the relative effect of multiple predictors, of course it's important to be aware of any potential uh, problematic levels of collinearity between the predictors. Um, so to make sure this wasn't going on, I calculated uh, variance inflation factors. 
and these were all below uh, five for, any, for all the ones I'm presenting. So that's just that although the number of locations and number of introduced individuals are possibly chronic across species, they're not, they're not related to the extent that uh, models have difficulty in distinguishing their independent effects. Okay, so now looking at the um, model predicting spread, again we have a strong positive relationship between the number of introduction locations and the probability of spread. Uh, the shape is slightly different than that for establishment in that it increases, the probability spread increases quite almost linearly from 1 through to almost 100 introduction locations. And at 10 introduction locations, the probability of spread is about 80%, whereas for establishment it was 100 almost. So that suggests that um, species need additional introduction effort over and above that required to establish in order to spread, which I think is, is very intuitive. Um, and uh, averaged across all values of independence variables, if you increase um, by one introduction location, the probability of spread increases by about 8%. Um, and now, interestingly, looking at the effect of uh, the number of introduced individuals on spread, it's actually overall a weak negative effect. Uh, so the possibly uh, probability was zero over that was zero, and the negative effect seems to be limited just to species that have been introduced to one or two locations which you can see in this striking pattern going on here. So the species that are introduced in one location or two locations, the probability of spread actually declines as you increase the number of introduced individuals. And there's one reason I think it might help explain this. It's possible that some species, um, as I think from Woodstalk, are very unlikely to spread because of their intrinsic um, life history characteristics, for example, they have a slow life history. So it's possible that what's going on with these species are trying desperately for them to become successful, introducing them in greater and greater numbers, but they just, they just keep failing. So I think that could be one potential explanation for this pattern of results. Okay, um, so the question I started with was um, which release strategy promotes inflation and success in mammals? Uh, well, these results uh, quite strongly suggest that the number of locations is the best predictor of inflation success in mammals, not the number of introduced individuals, supporting the idea that distributing the introduction effort is more likely to lead to inflation success than concentrating into large releases. Um, more broadly, this suggests that environmental suitability could be the strongest uh, barrier to inflation success. Um, and this is because basically, um, I think what's happening is that by distributing introduction effort, it's maximizing the chances that at least one of those populations is into a suitable environment and is able to survive, as long as it's um, introduced in a certain minimum threshold number of individuals. Okay, and um, more broadly, I think this could have some implications for conservation and biogeography. It might suggest more broadly the importance of habitat matching in the success of uh, small plant populations. So, could even apply to reintroductions or natural land colonisations, for example. Uh, all right, thanks very much for listening. I'm very happy to take questions at this time. locations at a very small scale. So a lot of analyses they'll lump locations as wide areas like countries for example and then they'll have multiple attempts per location. But typically our data is resolved at a very small location scale. So quite often different locations are also different times. So they kind of we can't really keep them apart in this kind of analysis that would be something nice to do because they are potentially that you have different predictions associated with those sources of heterogeneity. Have you considered human behaviour in this? Because if something is successful at one place, then people may know that you can A, release it successfully, so they will do so, so that they may get confounding, and also that once they know something is really successful, they may then not bother to produce large numbers of individuals because they know a few will do. Yeah. And that could be, was, yes, would be an alternative yeah. means by which this pattern can be um, I think that's, yeah, I think this would be true. I, I think, I, I guess ideally what you want to do then is we'd have to have an analysis where we combine the species characteristics with the anthropogenic factors like these, and then hopefully that would tease that apart, right? Or for it to do that, that would be something that we must do. Okay. Hello. Have you tried it without the phylogenetic correction? Um, I don't think I have. Um, because if you are 
subunit and species characteristics, and separating it, combining basically must traps and coitu seems to me to be the wrong thing to do. Um, the, the thing is, though, is that the way this estimates phylogenetic signal is um, on a continuous scale, so it doesn't just assume that there's a certain maximum level of biogenetic influence, like older methods, like independent contrasts would. It adjusts the biogenetic signal that it detects in the data to the model. And the values it reports are actually fairly low, so uh, it goes from 0 to 1, 0 being minimum, and they, they tend to be about 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So I'm not too worried about overestimating biogenetic signal here it's already scaling to the amount it detects empirically and it's fairly, it's, n it's not zero, but it's, it's fairly low. One would hope so, because otherwise it's saying it's an unknown phylogenetic effect. So I think we find it reasonable. Mm. Okay, I hope I've answered that. If not, we can have that. Okay, then, then so we have the questions and things.